How's it going? Jason Schron here, president of Pure Trains Inc. And uh, I am in bedroom F board uh, Burton Manor on the Canadian, somewhere in Northern Ontario. And uh, with me in bedroom E, right beside me is my daughter, Dahlia. Say, how's it going, Dahlia? How's it going? How's it going, how's it going? All right, so uh, the purpose of our video today is to do a kind of fireside chat, except that there's no fire. There's just beautiful scenery uh, and tracks and trains and stuff. Um, but the idea was that uh, we asked you for your questions. Uh, sort of ask me as the president of Repeal Trains Inc. Uh, anything really. And uh, so what we have is Dahlia has a uh, piece of paper with some questions. I have not seen them yet. And she's going to ask them and I'm going to do my best to answer. And sometimes I may have to say, I don't know, or I know, but I can't tell you yet. Uh, okay, Dahlia, let's go. What is one thing that you need for your home layout that Rapido doesn't make yet? One thing I need for my home layout that Rapido doesn't make? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a very bad secret that um, I started this company to get stuff for my layout. So uh, uh, if you look at stuff that ran between Toronto and Montreal in 1980, Rapido's made a whole lot of that stuff. Uh, the thing that I need probably the most for my layout is the MLW Canadian National S13 switcher because Spadina Yard in the 1970s and early 80s, I modeled 1980, um, when they, the, the S13s did all of the uh, switching duties. So MLW S13 is definitely top of my list. What's the biggest challenge facing the model railroad industry going forward? Oh, the model railroad, railroad industry has numerous challenges right now. Uh, challenge number one, I'd say like in the immediate right now is the logistical issue uh, of, of freight and shipping. So it used to take five weeks for stuff to get from uh, from our factory to our warehouse in Canada. Um, and uh, and now it's taking about three months. In fact, as I'm recording this, we have a shipment that left the factory over three months ago, about three months and, uh, and a week ago. Um, and normally it's five weeks and it just sat in this port and then sat on a boat and then sat at that port. And uh, right now it's on the ground in Vancouver where it's been for about four weeks. So, um, the shipping is taking such a long time because of a global uh, slowdown, and uh, there's just too much uh, too much demand for consumer goods right now. So because of that, um, there's uh, there's huge delays in shipping. So that that's the immediate concern right now. I think the long term, my the challenge that our industry has is the rising cost of lunch in China, and it's simple as that. Um, the way that that people are paid by the hour is determined by the, the cost of lunch. So when I was a kid, you could get you paid four bucks an hour, and but lunch at McDonald's was about four bucks. Um, now people are paid off in fifteen bucks in Canada, but fifteen bucks an hour because your lunch, a, a better lunch at McDonald's, can cost you fifteen bucks. Uh, so in China, when when I started making model trains almost twenty years ago, um, lunch was probably about uh, I don't know. 80, 90 cents. So that hourly is what uh, an employee could be paid because that was the cost of lunch. Well, now lunch is well over three dollars. So in, talk about in, in in Canadian money. So now people are paid well over three dollars. So the cost of living has gone up in China by like about a factor of five, um, and and so uh, the cost of labor goes up by a factor of five. Now people think, oh my God, you, you're not you're paying a, a, like a slave wage. It's not true. Um, if you look at, at photos from our factory, the people uh, at the factory have cell phones that are more expensive than mine, um, but they're making the equivalent of about $50,000 Canadian, which is a very good salary, because what they're paid will buy you the equivalent of a $50,000 salary. So where, where, what am I talking about here is as the cost of living goes up in China, the cost of the hourly wage goes up in China. So eventually, like, you know, they may get to a point where they're paid 15, 20 bucks an hour Canadian like we are here. But the biggest issue then is labor is the biggest cost of any model train. So uh, if you buy a model train, you've got your tooling costs, the cost of the molds, you've got your material costs, you have to buy the circuit boards, you gotta inject the plastic, you have to die cast the metal, you gotta get, turn the wheel sets, etc. But the single biggest cost is the cost of all those people at the factory assembling the models. They are, they're painting them, they're printing them, they're putting on the grab irons, they're testing them, etc. So our biggest challenge right now is that as China's cost of living keeps going up, wages keep going up, model train prices, have, have you noticed, like if you're a modeler, you've noticed how prices go up so much. Um, that we're, we're now talking like it's it's not unheard of to pay between three fifty and four hundred dollars locomotive. Well, when I started this hobby, the most you spend for a locomotive was sixty five ninety nine. So, 
that's the difference is is if it gets to a point where it's too expensive to make them in China, we're going to have a real challenge because that's where the talent is to make model trains. That's where in China is where uh, um, the, the skill, the experience, the whole industry of making model trains is centered in southern China. That's where it's like the global center. Uh, I, I, I estimate over 90% of model trains are made in southern China. So if it becomes too expensive to make there, we're, we're hosed. Is that a good summary? We're hosed? Okay, what's next? What are the respective backgrounds of your team? Professionally speaking, how did you all come to the industry of producing models? Well, it's a very big team. Um, I'll talk about uh, the PR and the, and the, the project management team the most. Um, so I started with a, a totally unrelated background. I did uh, a fine arts degree, visual arts, that's like drawing and, and painting and stuff, and graphic design. And then I went into a career into art history because I, I couldn't make a living as an artist. I didn't really want to. Um, and, uh, and from there, um, I abandoned that career path and started Rapido. Um, I ended up using a lot of my design skills, obviously, you know, the logo and all of our advertising. At the, the beginning, it was just me, really. And then the, the company grew really by knowing people in the mall train community. So my first employee was Dan Garcia. And Dan Garcia is still with Rapido today. And Dan, uh, he was active on, on, on model train forums online and we were chatting and we started emailing. I said, this guy sounds like he's got a real good brain on his head. So I reached out to him and said, what are you, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm working at a bike shop. I said, you wanna, you know, I'm, I don't have enough money to hire you right now. Wanna come help me out with some stuff maybe? And he said, sure. And well, Dan and I got along really well. And Dan, uh, without Dan, Rapido would not be where it is today because he was running the whole company, like uh, all the uh, operations of the company for so long. Um, and uh, so he's in the model train community. And then every time I would call one of my distributors, I talked to this guy named Bill Schneider. Bill Schneider, like, wow, you, he knew so much about model, this guy knows everything about model railroad. He, like, he's just, I was asking him advice. And finally I said, Bill, can you please leave your company and come work for me? And Bill said, maybe we should talk about this. And, uh, and then he came and was just total in project management, also doing some marketing and stuff. And so Bill's been with us since, two, Dan since 2007, Bill since 2009. Um, and, uh, and then that's how we've grown. We've, we uh, heard from, uh, uh, there's two guys, three guys that we have that work for competitors of ours. And, uh, and they, they reached out to us and said, you know, you guys seem to have a great company. I love what you're doing and I'd love to come work for you. Um, and uh, and that's how they came work for us, um, and and so really like the entire PR and project management team are all model railroaders, and we just make like Jeremy's a great example. Um, Jeremy came on board to be work in the warranty department, and I met him. And first of all, I knew within two minutes I was going to hire the guy because when someone's awesome, you can tell them right away. So I knew right away I was going to hire the guy, and then. Um, he says, by the way, I can do video work. Um, that's why I do a lot of that in my spare time. I said, well, you know, sure, no problem. I really wasn't thinking that much about it. And then he said, let me let me do a video for you. And he just took an RS-18 and did this little video, three minutes long, of how to disassemble your RS-18. And of course, it was like so superior to any video that we'd ever done that I said, Jeremy, um, yeah, you're not doing warranty anymore. You're the video guy. And so Jeremy immediately became our video guy. And you've, you've all seen Jeremy in our videos. Jordan was... Jordan worked in a hospital, but he also worked at a, at a train store. And I said, uh, I kept saying to him, Jordan, I want you to work for me. Like he's a, he's a clever guy, he knows his stuff, he loves trains, he's, a, he's, just, ah, he's just such a good personality. And I said, I, I, I went, and he said no. And so like it came to him like two or three more times and he finally, he was convinced by Dan Darnell to come work for Rapido. And Dan Darnell, I was, he, also, he worked at a train store. Dan and I have known each other for years and years and years and years. And he just came and said, I want to work for you. And I said, I got no money. So he said, all right. And he comes back, I want to work for you. And eventually when I had money, Dan can work for me. And here's the best one. Uh, the best story is Josh. So Josh was a TTC driver. Josh says, he also, he also has graphic design experience. He says, I want to come work for you. And so I said, I don't have any money right now, but I will in about six months. And so he said, okay, I'm going to come volunteer. And so he actually came once a week and volunteered at Rapido and did all sorts of stuff. Um, and then so when I had the money to hire a new guy, he was already there. So I said, Josh, you're hired. 
And uh, and then Josh came on board, I think sort of doing everything, customer service, whatever. And now he's he's major, he's like a senior project manager. So um, it's this is how, how things, Mohan, our, our COO, ended up because he was a model railroader. Uh, when employee Rapido knew him, we needed some help in the warehouse. He and I started talking. Mohan started working at Rapido. And then I needed a COO. And then Dan Darnell says, why don't you ask Mohan? I said, Mohan fixes models. Dan says, hey, I think Mohan used to be like the head of an entire department in Toyota Canada. And I said, what? So I asked Mohan into my office and uh, yeah, I had an extremely overqualified warranty guy who is now my chief of oper chief uh, operational officer. So, I mean, there's other, every, we've all got stories of people over Pito, but it often comes down to people we know in the industry, uh, friends, uh, people, you know, if you want to work at Rapido and we post a job listing, certainly uh, put in an application. I'd love to know what the biggest challenge Jason or Rapido as a whole has faced and how he or the whole team overcame it. Uh, that's a good, very, very good question. Biggest challenge we faced. Um, I think the biggest challenge we faced ever was, um, was a few challenges. One was when our factory that we were using in China told us we don't work with you anymore. We have too many clients and we don't work for you. And we had been planning for that, so we ended up um, starting another factory a couple of years before. But it was nowhere near the, had nowhere near the capacity or ability to make stuff like that first factory could. So that was a big challenge. And I'd say, looking ahead, knowing this would happen one day and and uh, uh, starting the new factory to prepare for them, that was that allowed us to get through there. Another challenge was I had a financing partner who uh, we just couldn't get along and we had to end the partnership and I had no money. So I had to uh, raise the funds and there was a wonderful model railroader who supported me at the time, an anonymous uh, model railroader who really supported Rapido and Rapido wouldn't exist were it not for him. Um, so that was, you know, I had the point where I had, was potentially gonna lose the company. Um, and then when I had the company, I, like I, I had nothing. I, I all my, I borrowed as much money as I could against my house and put that towards the company. And, and, and I borrowed money from this, this very generous model railroader. So that was a real challenge. I remember at the time, it was very hard on the whole family. You can imagine if you don't know if you're gonna have a company after uh, in the next couple of weeks or whatever it's gonna be, that was very, very difficult. And then ongoing challenges, the biggest challenge we've had has been quality control issues. Uh, we've had all companies with quality control issues. Uh, we do our best to control them as much as we can. Uh, but when like we had that whole issue with the RSA team motors, uh, that was huge. That was the, the motors and the decoders were just not playing nice together. Um, and uh, and we had to do we had to swap out motors and hundreds upon hundreds of locomotives, and it, it got people frustrated. Now. The warranty team is amazing. Uh, Mark and Dave uh, and Robin and Mohan, you know, when uh, Mohan was doing that at the time, uh, have been doing a wonderful job. And, and, and we also have a, another another Dave who's a, a big help in our, in our warranty department. Um, generally, when people come with issues, we fix them and we, we keep the customers satisfied at the end of the day. But it's really hard for us. We want, we want a perfect product. And, uh, and when we have issues like serious quality control issues, we've had minor stuff comes up. We had the issue most recently of uh, the, uh, the American F40 uh, truck side frames had the wrong bearing end. And, um, and the amazing thing about this, this with these bearings is it's a 99% it's a perfect model and one thing is wrong and guess like we get like tons of stuff dumped on us because one little detail on the whole model is wrong. And, and what, what I find so difficult personally about that is my project management team, my quality control team, Mohan, me, we all want the best possible model. We work as hard as we can to make a beautiful model. And when something goes wrong, it, it upsets us as much as it upsets a customer. And when customers have this attitude where, these guys, you know, they're just wasting their time, they're, they, they, you know, they don't know what they're doing, uh, they're not, they're, they haven't got their eye on the ball, um, they don't realize how much work goes involved into a model as complex as a HO scale locomotive <clears throat> and and there's so much love and effort and, and knowledge and we get help from so many different people, so many different experts and consultants helping us make a perfect model and it doesn't always work out that way. Doesn't mean that, you know, we're just like, you know, relaxing in Acapulco while the factory does, does stuff in China. We don't over, yeah, there's no oversight at all. We work very, very hard. 
So uh, I think getting over that hump of, uh, of the negativity is also quite hard, especially uh, for the team. Well, I'm, I can see the end of the train. That's really cool. Can you see the front of the train? That's, that's really cool. Okay, next question. What has been the most surprising engineering challenge you faced? Uh, engineering challenge. I'd say the biggest engineering challenge was one we kind of failed, and that was the turbo. Um, the 2008 release of the United Aircraft Turbo, my favorite train in the whole world. Uh, I just wasn't experienced enough. Bill wasn't on board yet. He had the experience. I didn't. And that that model, um, it operated like in terms of navigating curves, okay. But uh, the motors and gearboxes were a disaster, and it was it was a real. Uh, it did not run well. It was an unreliable model. Um, the most successful engineering challenge that we've ever uh, uh, is a similar experimental train was the uh, the APTE, uh, which is the Advanced Passenger Train Experimental from British Rail, and uh, that's entirely due one hundred percent to Bill Schneider. Uh, Bill Schneider did an incredible job designing that train, along with our engineer, Mr. Zhou, in, uh, in the factory. The two of them worked together for a year, uh, developing a system. This, this train, it tilts on curves, but British mall train curves are really tight, so it tilts. It's got a, it's got a, um, a single bogey, a single uh, truck between cars, right? And then it tilts on curves. The cars spread apart, apart on curves because British mall train curves are down to like uh, 17 and a quarter inch radius. It'll actually go around a 17 and a quarter inch radius, tilt, and then come back together and be really tight together. Like there's no big gap between cars. So that's Bill, and that's so our, our, our biggest challenge was overcome by Mr. Schneider. If you couldn't model your current model railroad, is there any other subdivision or railroad that you would like to model? Ah, I model the uh, CN Kingston subdivision. Well, Via Rail Canada operations on the CN Kingston sub, and if I couldn't model the Kingston sub, which is from Toronto to Montreal, um, that's really all I have ever wanted to model my entire life is the Kingston sub. I think I really uh, would want to do something British. I think I'd probably want to do something in the Birmingham area. Birmingham is like a real cent hub. There's a guy who has done a fabulous model of New Street Station. That's probably too busy for what I want to do. But maybe, um, no. Operations south of Birmingham have the line through Selly Oak and have the the, uh, the bridge there and, and, and all the Birmingham buses going underneath. And that'd be kind of cool. Uh, we actually have a, a diorama of that, if you. Yeah, that's what I'd model. There you go. Ah, but it's been done already. Okay, next question. In the past, you said that the LRC will show up on your is that still in the plan? How much leeway do you allow yourself when it comes to placing models that don't fit your December 1980 time period? Well, there were LRCs in existence in December 1980, but uh, they did not start testing on the Kingston sub until 1981, um, or service, and I go into service against sub until 1981. Um, so I model a specific time. Some people model a specific day. I model November, December 1980. I say November, December because the scenery is more November, but the timetable is more December when it was extremely busy. Uh, you could run two turbos a day in December, whereas they ran only once a day in November. Um, but I believe that it's a hobby. It's You do what you love in this hobby. And I love LRCs. Um, I love, uh, you know, LRC first class cars, which did, there was no, LRC first classes did not exist as a separate you know, branded car until 1985. Yeah, throw it onto the model era, right? Yeah, you got to have fun with it. And if you love a certain prototype, put it on your layout. Make make up some excuse and, and, and put it on your layout because there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to run what you love on your model railroad. The fact that you have a model railroad already puts you in like the upper third of our hobby because most model railroads don't have their own layout. Um, so take advantage of that and, you know, put whatever you want on there. So I think that there's, there's value and merit towards being narrowly focused so you don't end up buying one of everything it's a way to save money but if you, you you're modeling 1960s but you really love that that 1970s or 80s engine absolutely put it on your layout have some fun what's the best advice you can give to someone interested in model railroading that doesn't think he has the time money or real estate to do it properly the best advice i can give to a model railroader is you don't need you don't need to have the time money or real estate to do it properly because there's no such thing as doing it properly Okay, 
if you love model railroading, buy yourself a kit. You need a kitchen table. Work on your kit. That and you are you are a model railroader by working by building one kit of a. You can buy start off with an easy uh, building kit or freight car kit. When you can get advanced into resin kits that are more complicated, you need a, a suitcase or a drawer to hold your materials. You need a kitchen table to do your work. Um, the problem that, that a lot of us have is we're waiting for the right time. We're waiting for the right time to be a model railroader. And I tell you something, I recently lost a dear cousin of mine and it made me realize that today is the right time, okay? Don't wait till you retire. Don't wait till the kids moved out. Today is the right time to be a model railroader. And you don't need to have the massive basement to build the basement empire. You can work on one model and build a little diorama, 12 by 12 inches, that sits on your bookshelf when it's not being worked on and comes down from the bookshelf. Your tools come out of it in, a, in a little Tupperware bin and you work on your diorama. You can brush paint it. You don't even have to have an airbrush and a spray booth and all that stuff. Just, it's a hobby. Have fun with it and don't worry about it. You're not competing. I, I'm personally not a fan of the Master Model Railroad program. Um, those of you who are MMRs are gonna scream at me, the NMR you got scream at me, scream at me all you want, okay? Everybody who wants to be in this hobby can be in this hobby and it is equally valid for you to be brush painting a caboose model and then putting decals on it crooked as it is for you to be building an absolute 100% uh, accurate model of a CN Hawker Sibley van, okay? It's a hobby. It's supposed to bring you joy, and that's all it should do is bring you joy. What's the biggest screw up Rapido has ever made on a model? The biggest screw up I've ever made on a model? <laughs> biggest screw up, huh? <laughs> there have been some doozies. Uh, <laughs> the biggest screw up was um, when I was doing all the artwork for Rapido, and uh, the way you do artwork is that you design one side of the car perfectly, okay? Then you flip it because you've got the, you know, so you want all the striping to be in the same place, everything. You flip it over, but then you have to make everything that used to be backwards, you gotta flip everything individually. So, for example, you flip over the side of the Via Rail train car, then all the Via logos are backwards, so you have to flip each Via logo to make it the right way. Well, I produced uh, the Illinois Central baggage car on one side of the model, and then the other side of the model said the Central Illinois baggage car because I flipped each word individually. I flipped Illinois and I flipped Central and I had the Central Illinois baggage car. And if that wasn't bad enough, in the next production run, <laughs> I ended up with the Chicago and Northwestern baggage car on one side and the Northwestern and Chicago baggage car on the other side. <laughs> in both cases, we had to make all new shells and we had to fix them. Um, and, uh, and what we found is something really interesting. All the mistakes, this happened numerous times, there'd be something wrong, and often the public doesn't hear about it because we'll catch it before we ship it out and we'll fix it before we ship it. Um, but what we found was happening is almost all the problems were happening on the upside down side of the car. So we do artworks that had the car right up on one side and above it would be you know the side of the car, roof of the car, other side of the car, and we're in a tunnel. <laughs> and we're in a tunnel, okay, we're out of the tunnel. <laughs> peekaboo! All right, we should do it properly now. Like the, with kids and I do peekaboo when we go through tunnels. Right. So what we found was on the, the all the mistakes were on the upside down side of the car. So we made a, a rule that no more will we have upside down artworks. We always turn the upside down one over so that we're looking at stuff right side up. And our mistakes went down by like eighty percent because when that happened, because we're no longer looking at stuff upside down. And Jeremy's gonna put in a picture here for you of, of what it's like when you look at somebody smiling. When it's upside down, it looks like it's okay, but when you turn it right side up, you see how wrong it is. Okay, next question. Um, what is Rapido's best-selling model ever? Oh, Rapido's best-selling model ever. Okay. Quantity, our best-selling model has been the uh, HO scale Super Continental Lightweight Coach. We have sold um, a very, very large number. I don't mind sharing with you. We've sold between 20 and 30,000 uh, of that coach. Um, in terms of sales in one production run, um, our best selling model was probably um, our first run of RDCs. So we brought out the RDC. Everyone said, Why are you doing RDCs? There have been proto RDCs available for $29.99. 
everywhere you go for years and years, you don't want to bring up the RDC. And my attitude, shared by Bill, who was the, pro the project manager of that, um, was, no, this is a ubiquitous train that's everywhere in North America, and no one's done a proper model of it. If we do a proper model, people will buy it. And it was our, it was that, that produ one production one was our best selling model ever. Um, all going well, they haven't come out yet. If the PAs and PBs do, our production goes smoothly and they are shipped out um, in uh, late 2022, early 2023, based on our pre orders, I think they will be our biggest selling single run of the model ever. But we'll see. It hasn't come out yet. What model do you really want to make, but you don't think? Oh, model I really want to make is not enough demand. There's a few of them. There's some really cool stuff out there. There is, CN had some cool stuff. CN uh, rebuilt some SW1200s, uh, SW1200RS, with the, uh, the the long hood of a GP9. And and, and it, they called, it was called a sweep. And I think there were only 12 of them. And I would love to bring out sweeps because they're just such cool engines. I just... We can't use our existing 1200RS because the detail, like the chassis is different, the detail, the steps are different, the pilots are different. So it would be all new tooling for a fleet of 12. I would love to be able to do that. Um, I don't think there's enough demand. And then there's something that I've always wanted to make. It's called an RSC24. It, it is a, a weird CN hybrid road switcher uh, in the Maritimes from the 60s. Yeah, there were four. So that's, uh, it's not going to happen. So there's always cool stuff. People people tend to like the cool stuff. They like the oddballs. They like the weird stuff. But you have to have enough people wanting the oddball to make it uh, worthwhile. Um, and that that's the real challenge is, is, is quantity. You have to sell a lot when you're mass producing something. You have to sell a lot to cover all your costs. Is that it? No more questions? No more questions. Okay, beauty. Well, listen, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Dahlia, for being our question-asking person. You're welcome. I know how phenomenally exciting this was for you. And uh, for everyone else who's been watching, thank you for watching. And uh, please feel free to reach out. We do have Facebook Lives once a month on our Facebook channel. And there's a train passing us on that side. <laughs> we are in the hall. Um, and uh, uh, we, have, we have Facebook Live once a month. So go to our Facebook channel. And then that's your opportunity to ask all sorts of questions. That's not always me, but uh, Jordan and Bobby generally run them. And there's a variety of project managers to talk about all sorts of stuff. So we're going to get back to looking out the window and doing nothing. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. This train has been awesome. I feel like it's like, I feel like it's Yontif. I mean, you feel that way? So Yontif is Jewish holidays when we don't work. And you just kind of chill out for the day. And I've been chilling out on this train since yesterday morning. And uh, oh, hanging out with my kids on the train. There is nothing better. I got to tell you something. Everybody, you see what I'm doing here? I'm in a, I'm on a bedroom on a Canadian. Go sign up for Via Rails newsletters. Sign up for Amtrak's newsletters. Uh, there's discounts happening all the time. There's seat sales. Get on to an Amtrak or Via overnight train and just enjoy this. It is just perfection. And the fact that I'm sitting in a Bud stainless steel sleeping car built in 1954 is pretty cool. And then we have to go back to reality, which we're not looking forward to. Ah, uh, yeah, I know. Gotta go back to reality. But let's, uh, Let's enjoy this when we can.